on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, as broken hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. before the lion and the lamb and every knee will bow before him so open up the gates make way before the king of God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. Amen, church. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Stanwood Community Church. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this morning. Uh, what a privilege it is to gather and worship uh, our great Savior and God. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick announcements of sorts. Uh, this month's mission of the month is uh, Christmas gifts for uh, the sponsored children that we have through several different organizations, such as World Help and I believe Compassion. Uh, and then as well as Christmas gifts for our missionary families as well. And just so uh, we're transparent in this, uh, because for whatever kind of legal sort of reasons, because we're giving directly to uh, the families, we're not able to mark that as tax deductible. So I don't know if that would deter any of your generosity. I, I doubt it would, but uh, just know that those gifts are going straight to uh, the families themselves instead of through organizations. So... Um, and then uh, also make sure, members, uh, to vote for uh, the consistory elections. Uh, this is the last day to do so. And then we'll have, um, before either, either next Sunday or before, we'll announce sort of the board for, uh, for 2021. So uh, make sure there's some ballots still there in the back, or you can email or call the church uh, at any time. Um, and then also, uh, these Christmas boxes look amazing, um, and I know there's maybe still just a few out there, um, but uh, yeah, feel free to return those. I don't know, is it tomorrow? Where's Joyce? Joyce, is it tomorrow that they're getting picked up, or? Okay, Joyce is being very gracious. <laughs> so... Joey said that sometime this week they're going to be taken, right? And, uh, and so hopefully by the end of today, uh, we, can, we can have them all here. Uh, we are going to pray over them during our service now, and then uh, and, uh, we'll be shipping them out uh, to all over the world, really. So what an amazing uh, way it is to share the gospel. Um, but uh, <coughs> let's uh, turn our heart and attention and now to the Word, uh, going to Hebrews 4, uh, verses 14 through 16. And it reads, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let's just do that very thing. Let's draw near to our Lord in worship and song. So as you're able, let's stand together and let's proclaim these words.
sovereign God, O oh, matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing, and fall before the throne of grace, to you belongs the highest praise. These sufferings, this passing time, under your God, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy that we come to praise you for the love in which you showed us through Christ. So, Father, be in our worship now as we, as we have sung these songs, but also hear from your word and, and pray uh, for, our, for our brothers and sisters, your people, your children. Um, and, Father, as we pray for our world now, um, Lord, be with us. Um, grant us your spirit now that we may hear and do your works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now is the time we do take prayer requests. Um, yes, Susan. Okay. 
Um, speaking of COVID, Steve Mullins has contracted the disease. I found out yesterday or Thursday. Um, so we can pray for him. Bob and Cindy Guerin are both um, down with it. Uh, as you know, Bobby just started some treatment for cancer, so we need to be in special prayer for him for strength. Talked to him last night, and he's in good spirits. So just continue praying. Anyone else? Yes. Um, there's a young man, 16-year-old young man from Wayndo, was in a, a car accident Friday evening, I believe, and he, he, he died. So that's the prayer there. Um, for Altman, for uh, where Grandma Rudolph is, altar care. Okay, that's what I wrote, but I read it wrong. At altar care, just um, some of the staff has COVID, so for protection there. And Susan's praise was that Brewster Park is... COVID free as of yesterday, so praise for that. Oh, okay. Just in the one unit. They have a unit set up to take anybody to the unit. Okay. Be in prayer for Brewster Park. <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, Kim. For who, Kim? Gills. Oh, the Gills, okay. Yes. Um, Kim Karim just wants to say thank you to everyone for cards, letters, concerns, prayers um, while she was sick and to be in prayer for the Gill family. Uh, Tim, an update on V. V's doing well, and uh, Tim said she didn't want to face this cold, damp weather this morning. Otherwise, she would have been here. Brenda? Okay. Brenda, Case Beer, um, you're, you're undergoing treatment, right? And the tumors are shrinking, so that's good news. Praise God for that. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Father, once again we come to you and we boldly come before the throne only because Jesus made a way for us to come to you. Your everlasting love, your everlasting wisdom, your eternal care for us. Oh, that's what we ask for right now. and uh, Just in the treating of and helping of people we love, We pray for the Gurens, Father, right now, as they both are fighting and, and uh, experiencing the discomforts of the COVID virus. Uh, for my friend and brother, Steve Mullins, also, Lord, 
I ask that you continue to look after them, keep them safe, and help them to a quick and speedy recovery. We praise you, Lord, that Kim Karam is back with us, and she's fully uh, healthy, she's feeling good, and she's here with us, and Lord, we just thank you and praise you for that. And Lord, we do pray for the Gill family as they prepare to have Mason for a few days, if not for longer. Just ask, Lord, that all those preparations and everything needs to be put in place that you oversee and, and make happen for them. We pray for Grandma Rudolph and the staff at Alder Care, as there are some staff members that have tested positive for COVID. Lord, that all the residents and those there, that you protect them, build a hedge of protection around them, um, just keep them away from the virus, keep the virus away from them, and may they be continued uh, in good health and spirits. Father, we thank you for Susan Craig and her ministry at uh, Brewster Park, and ask, Lord, there for the same protection, that you build that hedge of protection around those people and the staff there, that this virus would be, uh, remain at bay for all the residents and people at Brewster Park. Father, I pray for the family of the 16-year-old young man from Waynedale who was killed in that auto accident Saturday, Friday night. Just ask, Lord, that you comfort them and remind them that you are God and you are sovereign and you are a loving God, that you care for us more than we understand so deeply that you sent your son to die for us. So, Father, remind that family of your love and your compassion. And I ask, Lord, for a deep-rooted comfort and strength and endurance and perseverance and hope to come to that family through all this. And, Lord, the grieving will be there. Lord, I just pray that it, it passes soon and quickly. And, Lord, just remember, remind them that you do love them. And the good news is, Lord, that as a Christian, as a, as a child of God, we know where he is. So may the family find comfort in knowing that um, you, have, you have him in your presence, Lord. Just watch over them, keep them safe. Pray for, and thank you for Brenda Casebear's report, Lord, that her cancer, the tumors are shrinking. Just ask for continued good reports and that this can be taken care of without surgery um, and that Brenda can return back to full health soon. Thank you for V. Schaefer and, and She's like the ever ready bunny father. She just keeps going and going and going. And I thank you, God, for her presence in our lives, for all the, the great memories, the great things she's done for this church, for herself, for her friends, and for her church family. Continue to strengthen her and nourish her. And Lord, I just lift up this time right now to you as we prepare for the message that you speak through me, that I allow myself to be set aside, and that what comes out of my mouth is what you want spoken, Lord. Use me as a conduit. Use me for your purpose, for your glory. Allow me to stand back. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I think it was in January of 2002, if I remember right, uh, my son Brody and I w went down to Ecuador. The church sent us down to look for possible ministries that we could become involved with down there. And while we were down there, one Sunday afternoon, um, after church, the pastor and his wife invited us out for dinner, lunch. So we hopped in their car. We got about two blocks from the church, and there was a man walking down the street. Probably my age. At that time, it would have been like, I would have been younger. Um, and he's about my age. And they pulled over, and this guy jumps in the back seat with me and Brody, and uh, his name was Tim. That's all I ever knew him by was Tim. And, and uh, the driver, Dan and Gil Manley, they knew him. They said, where are you going, Tim? He said, I'm going to the bus station. I'm going down to Manga Yaku for uh, a couple of weeks. He goes, can you, you mind giving me, drop me off at the bus station? And it's right on the way. And they, said, and they said, no, we'll drop you off. So we barely had any time at all to introduce myself to him and talk with him. Because like five blocks away, there's the bus station, he gets out of the car. We eat our dinner, we go home, back to Dan and Gail's. The next day, Brody and I get up, we catch a bus to go to Mangayaku. It's a five-hour bus ride. We were in Mangayaku for a week or so. That's where Eldon and Phyllis Yolder were, two missionaries. And we would travel into Shell, which is about 20 minutes away, two or three times a week, or... or uh, 
Puyo, some of these smaller towns, just getting introduced to different churches, ministries, and so Bernie and I were keeping our eyes open for possibilities for us to, to uh, go down as a church. Well, about the second day, we started losing water in Eldon's van. Okay, couldn't find out where it was coming from, but we were losing water. And that 20 minute trip to Puyo or Shell, and then 20 minutes back in 40 minutes, we were losing a gallon, two gallons of water. So every day we had to put in a gallon, two gallons of water. Well, we finally narrowed it down. Either the head gasket was leaking or the head, the head itself on the engine was cracked. Okay. We were leaving on Friday to go back to, to Quito to catch our plane to come home. Thursday evening, the phone rings. And Eldon, we're eating dinner, and Eldon's talking to this guy. And he goes, you say you know Craig? Well, okay, if you know Craig, I guess it's okay. Well, make sure you're here by 8 o'clock in the morning because we're leaving. We won't wait. He hangs up the phone. He says, do you know somebody by the name of Tim? And I said, no. He goes, he says he met you in Quito a couple weeks ago. I said, oh, yeah. He rode about three blocks with us in Dan and Gil's car, if that's the same Tim. He goes, yeah, he has car trouble. Um, they have a van. That they, they hit something with the front end, and it's all over the road. And he's concerned. He has to take it back to Quito, but he's concerned about going that far with that van like that, he wanted to know if he could follow us up or well, we follow him. And he says he knows you, so I said, yes, he'll be here at 8. So we get ready to leave Thursday evening. We have, everything. We have two big five-gallon jugs of water in the van in case that van's losing that much water. We can fill it up, stop, and get more water. So Tim shows up at 8 o'clock. Brody says, I'll ride with him. So Brody rides, hops in the van with Tim, this is the car, you can't hardly steer the van. And I'm with Eldon. And Eldon had also picked up a thermostat and a gasket for his van in case it was just a thermostat. It make it lose water. So we drive and we're going about an hour or so, and every once in a while we look in the mirror and Brody and Tim were behind us. And pretty soon we were driving and I said, Eldon, I haven't seen Tim and Brody for quite a while. He goes, I haven't either. We better stop and wait. So we stopped and waited about five or ten minutes. They didn't come, so we turned around and went back. And there, here's Tim's van with the hood open and steam just pouring out of this van. And Tim goes, well, I've narrowed it down. My thermostat's bad. Okay, we're in the middle of the jungle. There's no gas stations for miles and miles and miles. So we're out there in the middle of nowhere. Tim goes, I don't know what I'm going to do. He goes, I can take the thermostat out, I guess. And Ellen goes, I got one in the van. I bought from my van, but I don't know if I'm going to need it, but if you need it, and they're the same van, so we had tools within 10 minutes, um, the new thermostat was in the van, and off we go. Now, we were only an hour or two into the trip, so we still had at least three, four hours to go to get to Quito. So we're chugging along, chugging along, chugging along. Finally, we get to Quito, we take the van into the shop, we go home, and Tim makes it takes his van, he's all done, he made it. Two days later, I took Eldon back up to get the van, and here the van engine had a cracked head. He said, I don't know how you made it all the way from Mangayaku, from Shell. There's no way you could have made it that far, because we never put a drop of water in that van the whole time we were driving. I want to talk a little bit today about the sovereignty of God. God created all things. A few things I want to get clear with this, okay, all of us. God created all things, right? In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God has dominion over all of his creation. And dominion is God's control of all things. And providence is the means by which God is in control of all things. And sovereignty is God's right to control all things. Now, theologically speaking, sovereignty refers to, the, to, God's, complete, to God's complete control of all things. So all things that happen on, on this planet, all things that happen in all creation, God is in control of. Do we agree on that? There's nothing that ever happens in this world that God doesn't have control of. 
Do we agree with that one? Okay, good. The Westminster Confession of Faith states, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain what comes to pass. What it's saying is that everything that God wants to do, he's going to do. Okay? Anything that, God, anything that pleases God, he's going to do. It's his will. It's his way. It's his creation. He is going to do it. We need to know that God always was and that God always is, and that God always will be. Now, I dare not ponder too long on those three statements because my little brain starts getting a little hot and fried and smoke will come out of my ears and all that. I, I have a hard time understanding eternity past. There's an eternity past. We have the future, and we have now, and we have the eternity future. And God always was. That's all I need to know. Okay, that's all I need to know for now. Um, I wanted to turn, if you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 90, 1 and 2. If not, it's fine. I'm going to get there real quick, and we're going to read it. Psalm 90, 1 and 2. So God always was, God always is, and God always will be. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So everything I say today is going to be based on Scripture. And the psalmist says, you are from everlasting to everlasting. You've always been, always will be, always are God. In Colossians 1.17, Paul writes, He, God is before all things, and in him all things consist. God is before all things. He was here before anything was here. And in him all things are maintained, all things consist. Before anything else... It, God existed. Revelation, the book of Revelation calls God the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And the Bible repeatedly refers to God as being there before the foundation of the world. So God was before there was anything. It was just God. And not only is God prior to all things, but he also created all things. In Genesis, in the beginning, God created the world. The heavens and the earth. In John 1, 3, through Christ all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Everything that's ever been made or will be made, God has created God upholds, sustains all things. Hebrews 1.3, God is sustaining all things by the power of his word. God knows all things. God is all powerful. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The question is raised by the psalmist in Psalm 147. With God, all things are possible. It's Matthew 19, 26. God is in charge of all things. He is also in control of all things. Nothing happens apart from God's will. Psalm 135, 6. Whatever pleases the Lord, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in the deep places. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. That's, um, omniscient is a fancy word for saying all-knowing. I used to have a pet peeve about that when people would talk like that. 
He's all-knowing. So if God is infallible, if he's perfect, and he has infallible knowledge, he has perfect knowledge of how all creatures will choose, then he can determine in advance for sure how everything will turn out. Right? If God has perfect knowledge, if he knows everything, and he knows everything I'm going to do in my life and everything you're going to do in your life and everything everyone else is going to do in their life, he can determine without a doubt exactly how things are going to turn out. You agree with that one? If, if he's an omniscient God, yes. If he knows all things, he knows all things. He knows how the, the outcome of all things are going to come. So to have this kind of advanced certainty in things is to be in com complete control of all the results. So no matter what you face in your daily life, no matter you find yourself, God knows exactly how it's going to end up. Not only today, not only yesterday, but every day of your life, every day in the future. God has under control. He knows what's going to happen. Therefore, God's omniscience makes his sovereignty possible. Because God is all-knowing, that makes his sovereignty, his ruling over everything, possible. A sovereign God must not only know what will come to pass, but he must also be able to make it come to pass. Omnipotence, all-powerful, makes this possible. Therefore, a God who's both all-knowing and all-powerful can be in complete control of all things. He can be sovereign over all things. He's all-knowing, he knows everything, and he's all-powerful. He has all the power he needs to make what he knows come to be. Sovereignty is not only the ability to do everything God wills, but it's also the ability to do it the best way possible. Sovereignty not only gives God the ability to do all things and know all things, but he gives, sovereignty also gives him the ability to do all things in the best way possible for the best possible outcome. So here's one I'd never heard of until a couple weeks ago. Omnis. It's O-M-N-I-S-A-P-I-E-N-C-A. -E Omnispience, for lack of a better term. I, I looked it up in the Webster Dictionary. It doesn't even list it. But that is the perfect wisdom. Perfect wisdom. So perfect wisdom is also necessary for proper sovereignty. So you have perfect knowledge, perfect power, all-powerful, and perfect wisdom. So in summary then, given God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise, he can completely command every future event. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise. He can completely command every future event. Knowing for certain everything will turn out for the best. Not only are there no sur surprises for God, but the way the world will turn out is exactly the way he chose it and knew it would turn out from eternity past. I can't even tell you what's going to happen to me tomorrow for sure. But remember I said God was, always was, eternity past. He knew from there what was going to happen to all of us to where we are now. That is the sovereignty of God. That is the omnipotence of God. So I ask you, that trip to Ecuador, when Brody and I got in that back seat and we met Tim, we spent 15 minutes with Tim, and two or three weeks later, their phone call came, and the only reason Tim got to go with us was because Tim had met me and Brody two weeks prior, and our van was leaking gallons of water every 10 minutes, 
and Tim's van wasn't. But we had water and a thermostat in our van. On the way to Quito, Tim needed that thermostat and that water. We didn't. We never lost a drop of water. We got to Quito seven hours later, five hours later. That was pretty lucky, wasn't it? Anyone agree? Was that lucky? No. No. I said something last time I spoke about uh, stones of remembrance. Every time I remember, and I don't care who you are, Tim Schaefer, it doesn't matter. When I hear the name Tim, I go back to that week in Ecuador. How God revealed his sovereignty to me during that simple little trip in the vans. And that's what I'm going to encourage you today to do is I used to believe in luck. I used to believe in luck. I, uh, someone say something, you know, something happened. Say, Man, you're really lucky. Thanks. Yeah, I think so too. That was really a coincidence. And then when I started understanding who God was, I realized, no, it's not luck. It's not coincidence. It's God. And once, as you, in your lifetime, once you start attributing things to God, even luck and circumstance, when you realize that it's God working in your life, he starts revealing a lot more to you of who he is. And once you acknowledge that that whole deal with Tim and me and Brody and Dan and Gail and Eldon and Phyllis, that wasn't luck, that wasn't coincidence, that was God. Here it is 20 years later and it doesn't matter what I face in my life. Because I know God is with me, and God is sovereign, and God's will states that he will do the very best he can for the very best outcome in our lives. The last two weeks, or the last four years in this nation, how many think this world is going crazy, and we're, going, we're heading down the wrong path, and we're all going to be destroyed, and it's, just, it's, it's horrible, it's scary? I agree. I agree with all those statements. It's horrible. It's scary. We're going down the wrong path. Seems like evil is overtaking good. And there's more evil people in the world than there is good. And there's, there's pestilence. There's hurricanes. There's, there's storms. There's fires. There's earthquakes. There's COVIDs worldwide. Doesn't it seem like the world's unraveling? But there's one constant. God is still on the throne. No matter how hard we try, folks, no matter how bad you think you are, no matter how hard I want to try, I cannot change God's will, God's plan for this world. And that gives me great comfort. That should be giving you great comfort, great, great hope that no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what, what's facing us, Jesus himself says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he did that for us. He did that for you and me and everyone sitting here, all of his children, all the children of God, he did that for. That no matter where you find yourselves, that we are not defeated. The victory is won. Jesus won that victory at Calvary when he rose, died and rose again from the dead. He defeated sin and death. He defeated our enemies. And that's the promises. So when you find yourselves being discouraged, afraid, worried. Remember what God has done for you. He's made promises to you that, can God lie? No. He's perfect. So if God makes a promise, he's going to fulfill that promise. And he's promised us eternal life. He's promised us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's promised us that his spirit who indwells us will help us too, who will convict us and guide us and teach us He's promised that someday he will return for us. He's promised us that he's prepared a place in heaven for us. He's promised us that we'll walk hand in hand with Jesus someday. He's promised us so much. He's promised us life abundantly, above and beyond anything we can imagine. Is this world going to pot? Yes, I agree. Does that cause us concern? Concern, yes. Worry, no. I am concerned. I have children, grandchildren, and 
hopefully I'll get to see my great-grandchildren. Yes, I'm worried for them, but I know that if they're a child of God, they're taken care of. We are here on a temporary basis. We are here just for a short time. I don't understand what God does. I don't understand the reasoning for some of the stuff. I, you know, I cry out, why, God, why? The psalmist cried out the same thing. The souls of the beheaded saints in the book of Revelation under the altar cry out, how much longer, Lord? How much longer do you, are we going to put up with this? I look at our nation right now with, with all that's going on, the, the, the massacre of babies. I'm sorry. How much worse could Solomon and Gomorrah have been than what we are right now as a nation? I don't know. I don't know how long God's going to wait, but I do know he's a patient God. And I do know that he loves us. And I do know that he cares for us. He'll never leave us. He's always with us. He's guiding and directing us. He's holding us in his hands. And he is your God. And he loves you without regret unconditionally. He loves you where you are. And he's going to bring you into his, into his family. That's the promises that we rest on. There is no God like him. He's the only one God. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he means it. But boy, once you make that decision that, yes, Lord, I'm yours, when you surrender your life to him, you would not believe the weight that comes off your shoulders. If you're not a child of God, please talk to somebody today. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. But I promise you that if you, if you fall on your knees and call out to God and, and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and surrender your life to him, you're not going to regret it. I've never met a Christian yet that's ever said, boy, I wish I wouldn't have became a Christian. That, I don't think that happens. I don't know how it could. We are living in troublesome times. Are we living in the end times? Yes. Since Jesus, the day of Pentecost, went to heaven, we're living in the end times. That's been almost 2,000 years ago. Is it going to happen today? Could. Christ could come back today. It could be Tuesday, Wednesday, next week. It could be 10 years from now. I don't know. We don't know. But we do know we have an opportunity today to become a child of God, to be part of the family of God, then we're guaranteed. The, the Holy Spirit who dwells you is your seal. He is the seal of your inheritance, which is your eternal life. I don't like what's going on in the world today. I really don't. I'm not going to sit back on my lazy boy or chair and say, oh, what a terrible world. No. I'm going to remember all the goodness that God has given us throughout our lifetimes. Another stone of remembrance. I wasn't going to throw this in, but I will real quick. Holy, holy, holy is Luke Funderburg's favorite song. Detroit, 1995, sitting up there, 60,000 men in, in the, the dome. Clear at the top, Luke sitting beside me, I think, with a couple of guys. And we sang holy, 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 and that whole place just reverberated. I'll never forget that. 1977, in Pittsburgh, holy, holy, holy was the altar call at another Promise Keepers. Myself, Brody, Brandon, and Bryce, my three sons, went down on the infield and prayed together. Stones of remembrance. God will not allow anything to alter his plans, his perfect plans for everything. The nation of Israel, if you go back to Genesis 12, and God's talking to Abraham, and he promises him, I will make you a blessing. I'll make your name great. There's four promises. And one of them is, I'll, I'll give you the land. I'll give you the land of Palestine. A.D. 70, Romans came in and just wiped out the nation of Israel. Destroyed the temple. All the Jewish people just dispersed all around the world. And if you go to Daniel 9, 
I was talking about the end times. For the end times to be here, the nation Israel has to be a nation because the Antichrist sets up a covenant with the nation Israel. So in order for, <coughs> for the covenant to be <coughs> made, there has to be a nation. For 2,000 years, there was no Asian nation of Israel. May 14, 1948, Israel did, declared himself a nation. And the United States ratified that, said, yes, we agree with you. So in 1948, May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation again. After almost 2,000 years of no Israel, the Jewish people started coming back together. And they formed the nation of Israel. In 1917, the nation of Israel wasn't there, but Palestine was there. Okay. In 1917, there were 2,500 Jews in Palestine. In 1920, there were 83,000 Jews in Palestine. In 1935, there's 300,000 Jews in Palestine. In 1945, there's a half a million Jews in Palestine. Israel became a nation three years later, May 14, 1948. In 2006, there were 5.4 million Jews in Israel. In 2019, last year, there's almost 9 million Jews in Israel. God promises in Ezekiel 36 that he will call the Jewish nation back to their homeland, and their homeland is Israel. Now, the reason I say that is because for the end times to, to come full term, to get here, the nation Israel has to be a nation. This goes back to the sovereignty of God. The Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, um, many empires attacked and tried to destroy Israel. The Romans wiped out that nation, but they didn't wipe out God's chosen people. And God's been calling the Jewish nation back to their homeland over the last century. I have a doctor, and my wife and I both had a doctor that was Jewish, and I loved this man. We, I, and he wasn't, at first he wasn't a Christian Jew. I would go into the doctor's office and my appointment would be for a half hour. We'd sit, he'd look at me real quick and I know we spent 20 minutes, every, every one of my appointments, talking about faith. And he came to know Christ as his Lord and Savior. Okay? No matter how hard man has tried to destroy Israel, God's renewed and restored the nation Israel. For why? What purpose? The Bible tells us Israel has to be a nation for the the culmination of this world for heaven and earth when they combine. That's the sovereignty of God working in our world. We didn't do that. A little side note on that. 1973, remember 1973, I graduated. I was 19 years old, I think. Okay. Richard Nixon was president. This group here I know doesn't know too much about Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was uh, impeached. He was caught in a scandal, scandal called Watergate, and I think they were caught wiretapping some phones or something. Anyway, that was a, back then that was horrible. You don't do that. And he's being impeached. 1973, Israel was in a war with the neighboring countries. It was called the, Battle, the War of Yom Kippur. And Israel was getting annihilated. I mean, they were getting to the place of being wiped out. And the prime minister of Israel called the United States and asked for some military help. Otherwise, we're not going to be here. And Henry Kissinger made the comment, we're not going to help you. It's time you guys bleed a little bit. And he wouldn't help. Richard Nixon, when he was a child, 
he said, I remember coming home every day and my mom would always read us the Bible, always read the Bible to me. And I remember one day she told me, she said, son, someday you're going to have opportunity to help the nation of Israel. He said, when that opportunity comes, you do everything you can within your power to help the nation of Israel. 1973, young Kippur, there's battle. Richard Nixon was president. He was impeached. He was being impeached. And Congress told him, do not do any international, do not do anything. And stay away from any international affairs. We will not allow you to do it. We don't want you doing it. After the prime minister talked to Kissinger, it wasn't too many days later, I think it was a she, she called Richard Nixon's private phone and explained the situation. If we don't get help, military help, sir, we are going to be over with. There will be no more Israel. He hung up the phone and he remembered what his mom had told him when he was a child. Someday you will have opportunity to help Israel. Do all you can for him. And he made the comment, I knew right then why I was elected president of the United States. He sent military aid in. Israel was saved. But was that chance? Was that luck that Richard Nixon was president precisely on that day? No. That was God working in the lives of people to fulfill his will. So no matter how bad times get today, folks, in our lives, family, friends, God is still in control. I don't understand the majority of things that happen. And I definitely don't understand God's thinking. But I'm so thankful for that. What's Isaiah say? The prophet, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm so thankful we have a God that doesn't rely on human knowledge and wisdom, but he does what his will desires. He does what his will claims, and he does it perfectly, and he does it without our help, but he loves us enough. He wants to be with us so much that he calls us to his side to help him accomplish what he wants done. There's a song that's been ringing in my ear all week. We used to sing when I was younger, and it's something, this is my father's world. Does anyone remember it? And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, and oh boy. Help me not forget. Is that it? You're going to make me look at my notes, aren't you? This is my father's world. And though the wrong seem off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Unless we, unless we never forget that all those wrong seem also strong, that God is the ruler yet. Never forget that. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Seek those things up above where Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Remember how he's worked in your life. Remember all the things he's promised you. Remember the good things. Don't dwell on the bad things. That's going to bring depression, discouragement. Those are choices. Choose to live a life honoring to God. Keep your eyes on him. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I truly love, give. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for your promises, Lord, for your book. We thank you, God, that we have a God we can come to with all of our questions, all of our desires, all of our needs, all of our cries. You long for us for that, Lord. You long for us to come to you. 
Teach us your ways, Lord. Remind us to open up the Bible, the Scriptures every day. Remind us to spend time with you intimately, quietly, and time for, with you to just sit still and to learn and to know that you are God. We know you love us, Father. Continue to be patient with us. Draw us to your side. And may our love and trust and hope in you deepen with every breath we take. We love you, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, church, let's sing of that very truth of our sovereign God in whom we have our trust in. Let's stand and worship.
we want to pray over the shoe boxes here before we leave, so if you would bow your heads. Father, you are an amazing God. You love us unconditionally. You love us more than we deserve. And Father, we just want to share the love of Christ with those we come in contact with, and that includes our neighbors, our friends, um, those overseas, those out of state. We want to touch the world, Lord, for you. We want to be your voice. And Father, we just ask that you bless these shoe boxes through Operation Christmas Child, uh, Samaritan's Purse Ministry. Thank you that Joyce and the mission team continues to support and, and to promote Operation Christmas Child through Stanwood Community Church. Lord, we pray that every box that is given to a child introduces them to the love and faithfulness and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, use these boxes to further your kingdom, to bless these children. And Lord, that may you be glorified throughout the world. May the whole world come to know you as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior and our Redeemer. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you would be seated, we have a short video I think we want to see, then, then you're dismissed. Good. Habakkuk said, Lord, please tell me what you're doing. And God said, no, I'm not going to tell you, Habakkuk. Because if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. If God today told us what he's doing in the world, we wouldn't believe it. Don't you think God's given up and God's abdicated and God's left the throne? He hasn't. He's still on the throne. And those of us that know him put our trust in him and him alone. I don't put my trust in Washington. I don't put my trust in the United Nations. I don't put my trust in myself. I don't put trust in my money. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When all the rest of it fails and crumbles and shatters,